Our scripture this morning comes from the epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Hear now the word of scripture. Therefore, as a prisoner for the Lord, I encourage you, as people worthy of the call you received from God, conduct yourselves with all humility, gentleness, and patience. Accept each other with love and make an effort to preserve the unity of the Spirit with the peace that ties you together. You are one body, one Spirit, just as God also called you in one hope. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God, creator of all, who is over, through, and in all. God has given God's grace to each of us, measured out by the gift that is given by Christ. That's why scripture says, when God climbed to the heights, God captured prisoners and God gave gifts to people. What does the phrase God climbed up mean if it doesn't mean that God had first gone down into the lower regions, the earth? The one who went down is the same one who climbed up above all the heavens so that God might fill everything. God gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. God's purpose was to equip God's people for the work of serving and building up in the body of Christ until we all reach the unity of faith and knowledge of God's Son. God's goal is for us to become mature adults to be fully grown, measured by the standard of the fullness of Christ. As a result, we aren't supposed to be infants any longer. Infants who can be tossed around, blown around by every wind that comes from teaching with deceitful scheming and the tricks people play to deliberately mislead others. Instead, by speaking the truth with love, let's grow in every way into Christ, who is the head. The whole body grows from Christ as it is joined and held together by all the supporting ligaments. The body makes itself grow in that it builds itself up with love as each one does its part. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Belmont. I was here a few weeks ago. Sorry. I was here a few weeks ago when Kate preached and we had a full house, so I'll try not to uh, take offense to that. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Good morning. I tuned into NPR Tuesday morning on my way into work, as I often do. And I was struck by the voice that I heard. It was one of the officers who was actively serving at the U.S. Capitol on January 26th during the insurrection. I was emotionally tired this week, and so I wanted to change the channel really bad. I wanted to listen to some of my favorite music and kind of groove my way into work, but Holy Spirit said, pay attention. I've learned it's prudent to listen to Holy Spirit. As I became sucked into the story, my spirit was stirred by the account that officers shared from their personal experience, kept checking myself and trying to subdue, maybe even detach the emotions I was beginning to feel thinking, I don't have time for these emotions today. I have a sermon to write. (laughs) That's right. Now, I know this hearing is riddled with layers upon layers of dynamics. And acknowledging that, there was something particular that was breaking me as I heard these testimonies. The hate the unrelenting force, and the certainty the insurrectionists embodied. 
The fact that many of them were doing it with the names of God and Jesus and their version of Christianity spouting from their lips, printed on their shirts, their actions, their tattoos, their chants. And then I heard an officer share, at the moment I thought I would be killed by my very own gun, which had been confiscated by the mob, I looked up and I saw a Christian flag in the hands of my perpetrators. That's when I kind of broke. Part of my calling is being with people who've been marginalized through difficult situations. Situations where folks might be all alone in the world, in times when every hope seems lost, Moments when just surviving seems too much. And it is my prayer that with the strength of the Spirit and a whole lot of grace, that they see the love of Jesus embodied some days. So how was the Christian flag flying at the hands of the insurrectionist? How is that the same flag that flies outside of Glencliff United Methodist Church where we just opened a medical respite for our friends experiencing homelessness and where the members embody beloved community. How is that the same flag that represents me as a Christian? Knowing that this officer was in a state of crisis, his very life on the line, and one of the things he saw as a reflection of that chaos was... Jesus saves. We call this Christian nationalism, by the way, and I want to name it as harmful and unchristian, just to be crystal clear. It's why I prefer never to have a state flag of any kind in spaces where I worship. Christian nationalism is, as defined by Christianity Today in a recent article, the belief that the American nation is defined by Christianity and that the government should take active steps to keep it that way. It is also sometimes represented by fearful, power-hungry, traumatized, misinformed, insecure, manipulative people who have also been manipulated into thinking they are fighting the good fight. Siblings, we who also call ourselves Christians, who also claim the name of God the Creator and Jesus the Christ, need not only to pay attention but also radically embody the love and grace of our faith with a double portion and with as much fervor as those who've been led to defame and commandeer a faith designed on love and grace, on reconciliation, and on healing. Our faith is being misappropriated by some very unwell and misinformed humans. Not that this is anything new. Past and present instances of Christian nationalism, such as actively supporting and even demanding the enslavement of humans, abandoning, rejecting, and damning the LGBT community, conquering entire countries for God and crown. Let me make an observation. These are fights and systems of oppression that are fired up and fueled on by fear and scarcity, a worldview representative of humans' limitations and not in the abundance of our Christ. Also, I'm a person who's sort of an active listener when I'm in the uh, crowd, and also I'm an active listener up here. So if you feel the need to give an amen every once in a while, that's cool. Sorry, I might be screwing things up. Rolling over, ignoring these things, plugging our ears, 
only getting angry, turning a blind eye, like me in the car, because maybe it's just too much. These are not our options for a response. This is not why we were fully gifted or with what we were gifted. This is not our calling to be silent or acceptant, accepting of scarcity and trickery. In our baptismal vows as United Methodists, we commit to renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves, whether it's convenient or not. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul reminds us that our God is a God of love. And it is all of our callings, which each of us have been fully gifted to fulfill, to equip God's people, ourselves and others, for the work of serving and building up the body. It is our gift and our calling to embody this love, not by the measure of the world, but to be fully grown, measured by the standard of the fullness of Christ, whom we serve. In this scripture, it is not only about our gifts and our callings, it is a call to action. Live loud, my friends. Love big. Be generous. Live with grace and forgiveness. Check your ego at the doors and maybe toss it in the trash. Be bold. Go the extra mile. Comfort the lonely. Share your truth. Hear someone else's. Read beyond the headlines. Give someone the benefit of the doubt. Live simply and share so that others have enough. Break down systems built on white supremacy. Act, ask questions. Engage. Be and build relationships. Be community. Get out of your comfort zone and accept and celebrate all humans. May I also suggest a healthy dose of self-care. <laughs> in the process of this embodiment. It's important. We are called not to be infants in our faith who can easily be tossed and blown around by every wind or every issue that comes from teaching with deceitful scheming and the tricks of fear played to deliberately mislead others. We are called to speak the truth with love. And sometimes that is scary. And sometimes that takes a lot of energy. And sometimes it makes our voice shake. Let us be about shifting the narrative. Let us be about reconfiguring the power structures that we live within. We have an amazing staff and lay leadership team at Belmont. Can I get an amen? amen? Servants who are gifted in teaching and preaching and healing and guiding, helping us stay in the bumpers is what I call it. I could not be more honored and humbled to have been called back to what I consider my church home. You all have literally showered me with support and love and a spirit of abundance. It is overwhelming. My prayer is that in my time here together, each with our own giftings, staff and lay alike can dig deeply into our calling at Belmont and what it looks like for us to stand and pray and sing and dance 
Write, cry, shout, and work together, maybe even with other Methodists, maybe even with other people of faith, within our city and our state to find ways we can affect change, living as if our very lives depend on it, because they do. That feels heavy. It is, but do not be afraid. In case no one has told you lately, there is a lot of power at this church. The name Belmont United Methodist Church alone holds power, not to mention the hundreds of people who call Belmont home. And that, along with our legacy of freedom fighters, means that we have a lot of responsibility and a lot of work to continue doing. As most of you well know, we have opportunities in Nashville every day to use our power, not only to serve those in need, but to break down and disrupt business as usual systems that are not built for everyone's success. One of the most pressing crises at the moment, Kate mentioned earlier, is the expiration of the eviction moratorium. It ended yesterday. It ended yesterday. And we cannot sit back while a flood of our siblings become homeless and say, well, there's nothing we can do. The government stopped it, and now they're out of session. Maybe some nonprofits can pick up the slack. That's not okay. That's not who we are. So, this is where I need you to take notes. If you would, I'll wait while well, you can get out a pen and paper. We can call on property owners to accept Section 8 vouchers, not because there's something in it for them because it's the right thing to do. We can call on the city to release more Metro Action Commission's funds and always to build more low-income affordable housing. We can sit in eviction court as court watchers, making sure our fellow citizens know the resources that are available to them at this time and ensuring our criminal justice system is focused on the justice part. Letting people in desperation know that they are not alone. We can canvas apartment buildings and homes where people are at the highest risk of being evicted and listen to their pain and their fear because that is often what happens on those doorsteps. We can show up to our city council meetings and witness how some of our most vulnerable siblings are being talked about and treated by our elected officials during a global pandemic. We can share the Hope Line information, which will be in the newsletter this week. We can do this. We can do this and more even when our voices shake and we question our abilities or even our sanity, we have been fully gifted and fully called by our creator to embody the love of Christ in this world. We just have to tap in. May we be intentional in sharing our privilege our power, our giftedness, and our calling in the world. And when people see us coming, I pray we don't need a flag for them to know who we are, that it is our very lives that will reflect the love we espouse. Amen. <laughs>